Hi, this is Sean Clark. I'm here with Jason Voorhees himself, Mr. Richard Brooker. How are you doing today, sir? Good. Good. How are you? Not too bad. So you played the lead role of Jason and was the first to don the hockey mask in uh, Friday the 13th, Part 3. Uh, what was that like for you? Uh, that's correct. Uh, who would have thought, huh? Uh, 20, what's it, 23 years later, still going strong. How did you end up getting the role? Um, I actually answered a uh, ad for an actor in the Dramalogue magazine and uh, didn't hear anything back for four or five months and then just totally out of the blue got a call one day saying please come in and went in, met Steve Miner, got the role. Had you been familiar with the first two films? Not at all. Had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> Did you bother checking them out uh, to, before you made a decision? Uh, no. No, actually, it was a very interesting um, uh, casting session because they pretty much hired me on the spot. And um, I walked out of there not even knowing what I was pretty much doing until we actually started shooting, and then I find, you know, found out that it was this whole series. And, um, the, don't even know if they knew at that time that there would have been so many of them. Now, um, did, were, did you know going into it you'd be playing a mutated killer? Uh, well, I wasn't mutated. I was deformed, but I wasn't yeah. mutated. Um, yeah, I knew that. Yeah. yeah. Now, how did you feel about that? Any, any uh, res reservations of playing the role? Or were you, or, you know? No. Um, no, I don't have any reservations about playing it. Um, you know, as an actor, everybody wants to, to, you know, have a speaking part and act and say and feel and everything else like that. But you can still do that without actually having to, to say anything. I mean, um, there's been a number of very famous films in the past where the actors haven't necessarily talked a lot, you know, um, which is all part of acting. You know? Just because you talk doesn't necessarily mean you're an actor and you still have to play the role, be the part. So um, I don't think I did too bad. <laughs> now, did, uh, did you, I mean, how does it feel uh, having played this iconic character, which is, you know, the equivalent to the modern day Frankenstein or Dracula, Jason Voorhees? Is it, is it something that you, you look at and just can't believe or can't believe how popular it is? Uh, I can't believe how popular it is. Um, I haven't really done anything about it for, what, 23 years now, and um, I've had so many requests from people, you know, to go to shows and make public appearances and stuff like that, that I finally decided that, you know, might as well try it and see what happens. Um, I get invited to a lot of conventions uh, similar to this one, never go to them, never been part of it. Um, but it's turning into a, a much bigger thing than, than a lot of people realize. Now, is it something that you kind of distanced yourself from purposely because you weren't sure what kind of fan following it would have, or is it something that you just had no interest or time for? No, um, I think everybody has interest in, in exposure, especially if it's connected to something as famous as this is. Um, just been off doing different things, different avenues in my life. Um, I have my own production company. I do uh, well. Um, you know, if, I, if I have a down period and somebody says, come and do something, I'll say, sure, no, no problem. But I haven't purposely distanced myself from it at all, no. And how do you find the fans to be once you do meet them? Scary. <laughs> Scarier than I am. <laughs> uh, no. Um, it's actually kind of interesting to see that it's such a big following. Uh, you know, the more that I look at... Uh, the, the web, I think, has opened up uh, a huge fan base. Um, I didn't even know there were such things as these sort of conventions up until about two years ago. So, uh, and you find them everywhere, everywhere. You know, here in LA on the, the West Coast, they're apparently even bigger on the East Coast. Um, uh, I've just been booked to go and do two shows in Europe, um, and this is all within a month. So, <laughs> you know, who knows what's going to happen. Now, when uh, they introduced the hockey mask in the film, I mean, it was the first time it was brought in that, uh, into the series, it seemed to become the iconic look of Jason. Uh, was, 
how how was it being perceived at the time on set? Like, here's just another prop we're using. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I don't think anybody in part three actually thought that the hockey mask would have become such a big icon. Um, the fact that it did go over so well, I think, was probably what prompted them to push it into four and then, you know, continue using it as an icon. Um, the mask has changed a lot since part three. I mean, it's got bloodier and dirtier and <laughs> slightly different shapes and so forth and so on. But um, I don't know if anybody sat down in, in the beginning of part three and said, well, let's start an icon and let's use the hockey mask to do that. I think it was uh, just a way of um, making Jason scarier at that, at that particular time. Um, in part three, it was the first time you actually see Jason's face, too. And um, having the hockey mask helped that because it, it covered his face up for 95% of the movie. And uh, um, there's the, you know, the famous scene where I pull myself off the hanging rope and the mask comes off and you actually see his face for the first time. So I think you know, that was probably one of the reasons why they wanted to use the hockey mask as well. Um, so they would have a reveal you know, later on in the script. But I don't think it was planned that this hockey mask was going to be the icon for the next, what, seven shows, seven films. I, I might be wrong, I don't know. Do you know who's actu who actually came up with the idea of the hockey mask? Uh, I guess that's probably a million dollar question. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if it was actually... Um, well, it was written into the script originally, so I don't know if it actually came from the producers or from Steve Miner himself or from the people that actually wrote it. I don't know. What was it like working on a 3D film? Was that uh, a challenge at all? Don't ever want to do it again. <laughs> it was very hard. Um, they used a different type of 3D. Uh, 3D is usually done with two cameras. This was actually done with one camera, and it had a specially designed lens that would give you a split focus on the lens. Um, it was probably cheaper because it lays it down on one print as opposed to having two film prints. Uh, but the scenes were really hard to shoot because you had so much more to deal with all the time. Um, uh, some scenes, uh, the one scene with the poker where I stabbed the girl with a hot uh, fire poker, I think it was something like 32 takes to get that scene. 32. So it was long and tiring um, and hot. It had to be just right because yeah, of the 3D. Right, because of the 3D effect. Uh, some of the other scenes, um, uh, Paul, my good friend, uh, when he, he gets killed with his head getting squashed and his eye popping out, I mean, that took... We did that at night. It pretty much took the whole night just to shoot that one scene, uh, just to get the, th the, the correct 3D effect and everything else at the same time. As well as, you know, you're still trying to act, but you can't... You you were limited to what you could do because you had to stay within the bound the, the boundaries of the 3D effect, if that makes sense. Now all the work and effort and time you put into making a 3D film, uh, all the you know takes and whatnot, is it disappointing to you that it can't be seen in 3D uh, at home on DVD? I mean. Do, no, not really. Um, I think it still works pretty well. Uh, I believe that eBay has some kit that you can buy for like 25 bucks that makes it into 3D. Uh, I don't know if it's glasses or if it's something that you put over your TV screen or whatever it does. It's a shutter, shutter jog lenses. It's a little unit you hook into your, uh, your, v, your DVD player and has wires that run to glasses. And I actually have it. Okay. <laughs> and I have Friday the 13th in 3D. But, you know. I've seen it. No, um, no, I don't think so. I mean, th there were certain things that they did in the movie to try to uh, accentuate the 3D effect, like the popcorn and the guy with the yo-yo and stuff like that, which you look at and you go, well, oh, that's kind of corny, um, you know, without the 3D effect. Um, but I think the movie still works. I think it works just as well. Now, there's a famous scene that everybody's seen photos of that was cut from the film where you actually behead the lead actress in the film. What, what's the story behind that scene? Did the effect just not work? Was it cut? Was it supposed to be a dream sequence? What, what was the story behind that scene? Tell you quite honestly, I have no idea. Um, usually, uh, in most of the films that I've ever done, um, 
and I haven't really done that many, but they've always been alternate endings in case this one doesn't work or that one doesn't work. Or, you know. um, why it was cut out, why they did the dream sequence instead, um, I guess somebody sat down once the film was finished and said, I think it works better if we went this way. Um, to be very honest with you, I don't have too much recollection of, of the scene that was not put in. It was another scene that was done and we thought was going to be used and it didn't. There was a lot of things that get, you know, get done and don't get used. Now, were you ever approached or asked to reprise the role in part four? No. No, I wasn't. Would you have if, uh, if asked? Yes, I would have. Yes, I would have. Um, I probably going to say this out of my better judgment, but I think that if they had marketed Jason the same way as they had marketed uh, Halloween or something else like that, um, they could have created a bigger icon out of it. Um, but I'm not in the marketing department, and the, obviously somebody had a decision whether it was involved with uh, the actors or the, the uh, production or marketing or Paramount, New Line, whoever it was, I don't know. Um, I would have probably reprised the role um, I, just because it was a lot of fun doing, a lot of fun doing. And, you know, who would have thought 20 years later we'd still be sitting here talking about it? Yeah. As well as all the merchandise that has followed. I mean, you have your own doll from Sideshow Collectibles. There's, I mean, would you ever imagine a million years that there would be a Richard Brooker, Jason Voorhees doll? Never. And to tell you the honest truth, I've never even seen it. <laughs> um, actually, I have. I saw it once at um, Paramount, um, asked me to go down to, uh, what do they call it, Comic Con in San Diego. And I met the guy from Sideshow who actually did the design and the sculpture of it. And um, he said that he was going to get me one. I still haven't got one. But, uh, I haven't even seen it, to tell you the honest truth. It's really nice, it regardless. For me, I, but no. Um, I believe it's probably to be pretty good, and I believe there's a few of them out there. But um, uh, I haven't really capitalized on, on doing anything as far as uh, Jason Voorhees or Friday the 13th. So uh, there's some creepy stuff out there, though. I got some fans that send me some weird stuff that they weren't signed. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've ever received? Um, I get, you know, knock ahead, what do you call those, bobbing head dolls, and uh, some guy actually um, sent me a machete. A real one? A real one. It, it kind of scared the hell out of me, because at first I thought... Uh, you know, what's this kid walking around with me? This thing was so sharp, you could shave with it. It was terrible. I mean, and I went, I don't feel comfortable signing this. And it turned out to be a National Guard guy, and he was, you know, in his 20s. And so I didn't feel too bad about it. But I'd hate to sign a machete for some 13-year-old kid that uses it, you know. <laughs> it wouldn't make me very happy. That's true. Well, hey, I appreciate your time, Richard. Thank you. This is Sean Clark with the Horror Channel. Mr. Richard Brooker. We'll be talking to you soon.